<laughs> so should we hit continue, Tracy, or you will hit continue? So I'll hit continue. Okay, well, um, we have 10 people here so far and uh, I think we're gonna get going um, just because I know everybody is on a, you know, at six o'clock at night, we all want to finish up after this. So welcome, I recognize many of the, the names here. So guys, I'm glad to see all of you here. Um, I'm also very excited to, you know, I wish we had more people, but hopefully they'll show up um, to, you know, get back in doing these healthy conversation presentations and be able to, um, you know, present information that the community not necessarily always will have access to. So this is a way to get information into the community out there. Um, so I am going to share my screen here just for a second. Let me get Sure, I'm on the right. Oopsie, wrong one. Okay, and I'm just going to move this, get all situated. This is what we have to do with these Zoom meetings. So, um, thank you everybody for being here. You know, I know it's, it's on Zoom and it's a six o'clock on a, you know, on a weeknight. But I really appreciate people you know, joining us and I hope that you find value in what we're talking about. Um, I also really want to thank my two additional speakers, um, Anna Tuttle, who is a registered dietitian and Dr. Mark Corkins, uh, who's a gastroenterologist. Um, both are from Le Bonheur. Um, and so I, I, I really want to say thank you to both of you for, you know, joining me with this and doing this presentation. Um, you know, me being from the basic science side, I can talk all the science all day long, but I really, I'm so happy that there are people that can talk a little bit more about the clinical side of all of this. Um, and so the, the format of this kind of seminar will be that each of us uh, will do maybe a 15 to 20 minute presentation. Um, if you have a burning question to ask at that point in time, you can ask questions, but you can also wait until the very end and then we'll have, you know, more of a discussion. Um, and you can also ask all your questions. Um, Anna will, I am going to start off and I'm, my, my goal is to kind of introduce just the GI tract and all its components, um, talk a little bit about the science and how we've gotten to know the things that we know um, at this point in time. Anna will probably spoke, speak more about application, talk about dietary, not necessarily applications, but diet and how it affects the micro, you know, the gut. And uh, Dr. Corkins will talk about uh, bacteria as therapeutics. Um, and so I hope we kind of cover the whole, you know, everything about the gut and all the questions that you might ever have. And then if you still have questions, you can ask that. And so with that, I, oh, let me introduce myself too. My name is Marie Vandermeuver. I am a faculty at the, in the College of Health Sciences. I'm in the Nutrition Science Division. Um, and my laboratory and myself, my interests really focus on the interactions of nutrients, and uh, the immune system. And so along the way, I've really kind of gotten, you know, learned that I cannot ignore the gut, right? The, the path from the food to the immune system really goes through the gut and all of the things that go with that. And so with that, I'm just going to start um, telling you a little bit more if I can get my slides to move. There we go. And so, I mean, we've, we all know, and we've known for a long time that food is critically important for health. The first thing that goes if you're malnourished is you become immunosuppressed and you, you will get, get infections. Um, we also now are in an obesity epidemic, so we also know excess food, you know, lead to many chronic health conditions. And so there is a, a health line between food and health. The way that we have typically studied food, food components and nutrients was to look at how these um, components interact with organ systems. Um, we've also looked at how it, you know, affects cells, different cell types. And then we've also learned that it, how it gets integrated into kind of our metabolic processes, right? So if we look at this very complicated metabolic chart down here, we know that there's all kinds of places that these nutrients will interact with 
our metabolism, and all of these, you know, then have a specific health outcome. And in, in looking at all of this, we've really ignored, and not necessarily by choice, uh, a huge component that have an incredible um, effect on this, what I'm going to call health my health line, right? And this is uh, the microorganisms that live in and on us. And so for this presentation, we will focus mostly on the bacteria and mostly focus on the bacteria that resides in your, your gut. And so we call this the gut microbiota. Um, and so even though we've known that they're there, uh, you know, it's really maybe 20, 20, 15 years ago that we've really started uh, to be able to monitor them. And this has all come because we now have these genetic tools where we can do genetic sequencing. Um, and we've also identified little uh, DNA sequences within these bacteria so we can identify the bacteria and also see what is there. And so what we've learned in the, in the last 15 years is that these, this my, you know, microbial organ really responds to the food that we eat and it also has an output that has a direct effect on our health. And so looking at the, you know, your gastrointestinal tract, um, if you look at the gut microbiota or gut microbiome, um, our gastrointestinal tract is not kind of equally colonized from beginning to end. Um, there's different regions that have different types of bacteria. And so if we just think about the stomach, for instance, which is, you know, has a, it is very, um, acidic, it has a low pH, so it's not suitable for a lot of bacteria. And so if you look at the numbers here, you can see the numbers of bacteria that, that resides in, in the stomach itself is pretty low. And there's also very few um, species of bacteria that will survive there. And then as we move into the small intestine, um, you can see that the numbers are now increasing. And then there's also a different Kind of repertoire of bacteria that can now survive in this environment. And I really want to want you to think about the bacteria that live in the specific environment. Um, it is the environment that really allows for a specific bacteria to reside there. So it's ecological site. So stomach being different from the small intestine. But then as we move down into the large intestine, right, these, this is the most densely colonized area um, in your body, okay? And in your, in your large intestine, you have trillions of bacteria. Um, you do not only have trillions of bacteria, we, we now also know that there are hundreds and maybe thousands of species that can reside, that can live within, um, within your colon, within your large intestine. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean that each of us have say all thousand species, there's probably only between 100 and 200 species that reside in each one of us. Um, and they're not the same. This, uh, this, like your specific microbiome is almost like a fingerprint. Um, it's very different from, uh, from, the next, from the next person. And so it's really your life experiences that dictates your fingerprint. Um, but I mean, there's many things that can affect it. And so I'll go through some of these and how it, um, you know, it changes the, the composition of this bacteria. So I put this picture up and this is from the Sonnenberg lab at Stanford. And it's really, um, so it's a, a micrograph. So it's a picture taken with a microscope with fluorescently labeled uh, bacteria and fungi. So this is, so let me just orient you for a second. So if we take the intestine, so if this is intestine and you think of it as a tube and we take a cross section and now what we're focusing on is really this kind of this triangle right in here, right? In the middle of this tube, you will have the, this is where all the bacteria will be. And so this is what you see with all these fluorescently labeled bacteria, fungi. Um, they can also be viruses, bacteriophage, archaea. There's all kinds of microorganisms residing there. Um, the other thing that you can see, these, the blue on the other side, um, this is the actual cell. So these are actually your cells that line your intestine. So it's the cells right at the very kind of tips, tip here of your villi um, that line the intestine. And I think it's not very clear in this picture, but what is critically important is that these cells are very um, densely, well not necessarily densely packed, that they are, it's one cell layer, 
but they have, there's no gaps between these cells. So these cells are tightly packed next to each other and they actually have between each, and so if you think of it, so these are actually the nuclei and this is the whole cell here, but between two cells there are actually something called a tight junction. So these are these little formations between cells that keep these cells, you know, uh, keep the barrier closed. And so it is actually when we lose these tight junctions and we lose this barrier that you will develop things like leaky gut. So I know some people are familiar with, with the term leaky gut. So, um, and so what that means basically is that things can kind of leak in from the lumen of the intestine and get onto this side, which is of course where you, where the blood is. The other glaring thing in this picture is this green slimy layer. Okay, and this is exactly what that is. That is a mucus layer, okay? And this mucus layer is incredibly important to keep these microorganisms at a decent distance from these cells, okay? Never is it so important as, you know, the saying of good fences make for good neighbors. This is a critically important fence. This mucus is made by cells within this layer. So your own cells make these, this mucus and then this mucus uh, within this mucus, there's also antimicrobial peptides, but what it does is it keep these bacteria, these microorganisms at a decent distance from your cells. And so you don't have unnecessary activation and inflammation um, that can occur in your gut. And so the bacteria, so these bacterial cells that you have, and so for the presentation again, we'll probably just, we'll mostly just focus on bacteria. Um, and so the combined microbiome. And so what I mean by microbiome is the combined genome of all these microorganisms that live or the bacteria that resides in your gut, right? So if we take all the different microorganisms and we combine all their genes, that is what the microbiome is. And so the combined microbiome, you know, it's predicted that it has almost 3 million genes. Okay. And so just for reference, if you guys remember uh, from, you know, 2000s when we, when we sequenced the human genome and realized, oh my goodness, we didn't have as many protein coding genes as we thought. Humans have only between 20 and 25,000 protein coding genes, genes, what we think of as genes, right? So that means that within this microbial organ, we have about 150 times more genes. And that allows for many more metabolic processes that we do not, you know, we don't have in our genome. So these bacteria really have a, 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 an incredible metabolic capacity. Um, and so just to kind of tell you about a little bit more about the, uh, the type of bacteria that we have there, let me just move, I don't know if you guys can see this, but the, um, the, the bacteria that we have in the gut, the predominant, predominant phyla that we see in humans um, are divided between six different phyla and not important to memorize names or anything here, I will just point out that the two, uh, the, the two most abundant phyla is Firmicutes, so the one that you see at the top here, and Bacteroidetes. And between these two, they make up about 90% of all the bacteria that's in your gut. Okay. Okay, so that's great. So we now know that we have trillions of little bacterial, you know, bacteria living in us. Where is this coming from? Where, how did we ever, how did they ever get to be in us? And so um, humans are born somewhat sterile, and I will say this is a controversial statement right now because um, we used to think that babies were born with this completely sterile gut, but over the last couple of years, there has been some controversy about, you know, some bacteria being translocated from the mom's intestine actually through the placenta into the baby's gut. So this is still a very controversial Kind of topic, but what we what I can clearly say is that the gut of that baby at birth is pretty barren. There might be some bacteria there, but there is definitely place. Uh, there's definitely space for colonization of new bacteria, and so the way that you are born, your birth mode. Um, let me just admit this person. Your birth mode is really uh, really determines the first colonization. And I am going to just show you some data from a paper that was published in 2019. And so what they looked at was babies born via the birth canal, so as, you know, a normal vaginal birth, and they compared this with babies born via C-section. And what you're looking at here is um, 
there's a distribution of bacteria basically. So every color that you see here indicates a different bacterial genus, okay? And so if you look at, so, and this is day four, so day four after birth, and you can see that this baby born via, uh, you know, the a vaginal canal, you can see that this baby has a very different composition of bacteria if you compare this to the C-section, okay? The bacteria that you find in the vaginally kind of birth baby uh, usually resembles mostly, mostly the mom's, uh, you know, birth canal and also some of the intestinal bacteria, while the bacteria that's on the C-section baby, it's most of it is actually coming from skin and then also uh, from the hospital setting. Some of the bacteria that you typically find in a hospital, you know, it's an empty space. So things will start colonizing and there's nothing, if there's nobody else there to colonize, things will just take space, uh, take up that space. But I think what's also quite uh, striking about this paper is they, so they looked at the kind of the change in the microbiome over time. And, you know, if you just look at from day four to 21, the first three, three weeks, you can see that there is a dramatic change um, in this microbiome. And of course, this is mostly driven by what the baby will eat. And I know, I think Anna will talk some about, you know, different forms of, you know, feeding and baby and how it might change. But so just to demonstrate, this is, it's a very plastic environment. You know, this is not set in stone. And then as you grow, you know, the next thing that happens is you start eating solid food. And it's really at this point where, um, let me just move this away again. I don't know if you guys can see this, but uh, um, the solid food really, uh, man, let me put it up here, also causes a dramatic expansion of um, kind of the, the microbial, microbial diversity. And so you'll hear me using this word often and diversity meaning how many different types of bacteria you basically have, okay? And if you, and so again, this is a paper that was published in 2012, but I think it's also a very good paper to demonstrate how age, and so if this is birth, and you see this is age, and we'll just call this is your level of diversity, you can see how diversity is increasing from birth up to about, I would say 10 to 14 years, um, and at that point, it becomes quite stable. And you basically really kind of have your, your composition at that point in time, unless there's big changes in your life. And you keep it, you know, for, for the most part throughout your life. And, you know, with aging, it, there's some decrease in, in the, 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 the types of bacteria that you might have. But it's just the point that I want, really want to make is here is this initial, you know, as you adapt to your new environment, as your new human being adapting to your new environment, you get this dramatic expansion of the, the bacteria that lives on you and, you know, and it also det determines who will be there. The other thing that I just want to point out in this, in this uh, graph is, so they did this study and they looked at three groups of people. Um, the one on the bottom is from the USA. And so this is the blue dots. Um, and then green and red, I see the green and red dots. Um, and these are uh, two groups of people that follow a pretty kind of traditional lifestyle. And if you just look at the amount of diversity, what I want to point out is that the West, so US, where we typically follow a Western diet, there is a decrease in the amount of bacterial species, so what we call diversity um, in this. So diet seems to be playing an effect. And I'll try, I hope I'll convince you throughout this presentation that it has a huge uh, role. Um, and so apart from being born and then kind of getting your first bacteria, there's also other things that can affect uh, your microbiome. Genetics play a role, but people have shown kind of over and over now that genetics play a minor role, not as much as I would say the environment. Host physiology, age, as we've seen in this previous graph, age can play a role. Stress, you know, every time you work with stress on you, your microbiome has to respond a little bit to it, how much exercise you do, and then also your disease states. So different diseases will also affect uh, your um, microbiome. And then your environment really has a huge effect uh, on the bacteria that lives with you, your living conditions. If you tend to be a person that likes all every single thing, and this is probably what we've done over the last year, so we have maybe changed some of our microbiome just because we've been trying to get away from, from other viruses. Um, but living conditions, even if you have a pet, all of these things will, you know, affect the bacteria that lives in you. Um, medications um, and 
antibiotics is a great example. And I, I don't think I have to introduce this to everybody. Everybody knows how antibiotics not just kills the target, but also will kill off many other bacteria that might have health benefits. Um, I will also mention here, um, because this is really an expanding field in the microbiome area, is that medication will also be metabolized, can be metabolized by the microbiome, right? And so if you have, a, so if I have two people taking the same medications, but their microbiomes differ from each other, they might actually have a different effect in how that medication might affect them. Okay, so this is a very active area of study um, as far as how the microbiome might affect the medications that you take. And then of course diet, and diet is really the, the topic of this discussion tonight, and diet is really the, the main determinant of the bacteria that lives in your gut. Um, many diseases are associated with um, dysbiosis, and the word dysbiosis me really just means a, a disbalance um, in pro-health and pathogenic bacteria. And so any condition that you have where you kind of tilt the balance to away from your, your healthy, what we call healthy bacteria, um, you know, this, this state is now associated with many diseases. And some of it is very easy to kind of understand. So inflammatory bowel disease, colon cancer, just because the microbiome, you know, it's right there in the gut. Um, you can kind of see how these two things can interact. But even diseases that's distant from the gut, so such as neurological um, disorders, we don't typically think of neurological disorders having a gut um, component. Um, and actually it has a huge gut component, but so the gut can affect this and depression is uh, something that has been shown to be really uh, connected to, you know, uh, a, dis a dysbiosis or a, a disbalance in the bacteria. Um, autoimmune diseases, and so for those of you who don't know, 70% of your immune system actually resides in the gut. And so as the gut changes and you might change your immune system, that also will have effects in peripheral tissues. And so this might even alter um, autoimmune disorders at distance, at distance organs. And then, you know, a, a big area where everybody's, you know, until COVID, everybody was studying uh, obesity and metabolic diseases, including type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And so there's also an association, and I use the word association because it's a chicken and an egg thing. Um, between these diseases and uh, uh, this balance within the gut. And so people have looked for specific bacteria to kind of, you know, see if these things, what changes and how they can correlate it to specific diseases. But almost in every single health outcome, what they found is a highly diverse gut microbiome is associated with health. And so whenever you have any of these diseases, it's when you lose diversity, okay? And you restrict the type of bacteria that you have. And so the goal for us should really be to increase the diversity of our microbiome, okay? To have as many different uh, microbiota present in our gut as possible. And I, I drew this little small intestine to kind of make the point of how food really functions. And so this is my little, you know, uh, PowerPoint intestine, and I'm just going to orient you a little bit here. So we have the small intestine over here, large intestine. Um, in the large intestine, we have all the, or the bacteria, and of course, there would be many different types of bacteria. And then my little stars would be my immune cells. Okay, and so the food that we eat, if these are, if this is processed food, or if this is food uh, for which we have um, enzymes that are able to digest it, this will be the food will be broken down, and most of these nutrients will be absorbed in the small intestine. And so it really is only the food components that make it through to the large intestine that have a dramatic effect on the microbiota in the, in the, in the colon. And so I think the first thing that typically comes to mind and if, you know, for everybody is like, so fiber, you know, I don't break down fiber, so fiber will go into the colon, it will have an effect, absolutely. Um, fiber is one of the main um, drivers for, you know, maintaining and also changing uh, the, the microbiota that's in your gut. And so, but I do want to, so fiber also now has a new word that people are using, and this is microbiota assist, accessible carbohydrates. So if you ever see MAX, this is what this stands for, and it really refers to the carbohydrates for which we do not have digestive enzymes that will make it through into the, to the large intestine. Um, I do want to say that 
it is not just fiber and not, not just these uh, complex carbohydrates that affect the microbiota. Protein that can, you know, protein can make it through or amino acids, um, fats, and also polyphenols. And so polyphenols are typically found in fruits and vegetables. You find it in blueberries, grapes, red wine. Um, these are not well absorbed in the small intestine and they make it through to the large intestine and can also have an effect on, on the microbiome. And so how does it do this? And so if we just, so we'll take fiber as an example. And so as we, you know, eat something that's highly complex and it's not going to get broken down in the small intestine, it makes its way all the way through to the large intestine. Okay. And in the large intestine, there would be, remember there's 3 million genes and many of those genes now have the capacity to break down fiber. So it can metabolize fiber into different, you know, into other different molecules. And so we will call these the metabolites, right? So these are the metabolites from the breakdown products from this fiber, for example. And so it's not that we use the bacterium itself and it's, it is really these, these breakdown products or these metabolites that actually interact with us, okay? And so the metabolites do many different things. It can actually stimulate cells. And so remember these were the little blue cells that have tight junctions stimulate some of these in this layer, their cells that can make mucus, they'll stimulate these cells and they'll make more mucus, okay? So having a high fiber diet will increase the mucus lining, okay? Uh, these metabolites will also improve the tight junctions. So it is a great energy source for this epithelial layer and it will improve tight junctions, again, improving this barrier function. Um, these metabolites also interact with your immune system. And so, um, as we make beneficial metabolites, it will signal to your immune cells and these immune cells will then become tolerant to your commensals. And commensals will mean it's the bacteria from which I get something, you know, it, I get something beneficial, but, it, uh, it, but it's not harmful to me. And so the immune cell becomes tolerant to the bacteria and the bacteria can kind of stay in your, immune, in your, uh, in your intestine without the immune system getting activated. The other thing that these metabolites can do uh, is that it can also cross feed other bacteria. And this is, I think, something that's less well, you know, understood and people talk about. So it also feeds other bacteria. And so to, to demonstrate this, I put this here, I just kind of wanted to give an example. And so if you think about a, a carbohydrate such as inulin, and inulin is a highly uh, fermentable carbohydrate. So it's not, it does not get absorbed in the small intestine, makes it through to the large intestine. Um, but inulin does get fermented by a bacteria called bifidobacteria. And you might have seen bifidobacteria in some of the probiotics that people use. So inulin gets um, metabolized or fermented by bifidobacteria. You will also see increase in bifidobacteria, right? So because they now have a good ecological site for them to grow. The products from bifidobacteria is acetate and lactic acid. Again, don't have to memorize any words, but the, these two products, um, I don't, you know, I'm not going to use but it is going to be used by different bacteria. And so this, again, big word for Kylie bacterium prasnitsi will actually then use this as food. So this is a resource for this bacteria. And then prasnitsi makes butyrate. And butyrate is one of the main short-chain fatty acids, so main metabolite, that then drive many of these processes. Um, actually, 70% of the energy for this lining comes from butyrate. Um, five to 10% of your daily energy use is actually from some of these metabolites. So it is not a trivial thing. There's actually a lot of interaction that we have with these uh, metabolites. And I just put this paper up. This was a Hallmark paper in 2010. And what this paper, what they did in this paper um, was to look at two groups of people that had very different diets. And so what I, at this point in time, we didn't know how diet really affected the microbiome. Okay. And so they used a group of kids actually from Italy. And so this European group is a group of kids from Italy and they compared their microbiome. This is their microbiome composition. And these are the, the and you see this is bacteroidetes, firmicutes, the, the two main groups. And they compared it to a group of kids in Burkina Faso. And so this is in Africa and these kids um, eat again, a very traditional diet. And so just by eye, if you just look at the colors, you can see that there is a dramatic difference um, between these two groups. And they did many other additional studies to show that it is not um, genetics. Um, and that is really that it's the diet between these groups that's different that actually drove the differences and also the increase in diversity that you'd typically see with this group. 
Okay, so this is this is um, 2010. It's just 11 years ago, um, and this is what we knew at that point in time. Between then and now, people have done all kinds of studies on any type of you know paleo diets, ketogenic diets, uh, high fiber, low fiber, gluten, all kinds of diets to see how it affects the the microbio microbiome. Um, and what we can see is that the kind of the composition of your microbiome can, can change um, in as short as 24 hours. So if I go from a completely plant-based diet to a protein, uh, an animal-based diet, in 24 hours, I actually have the capacity to change some of that uh, microbiome. I will still say that you are not going to completely change that in that time. You still have your baseline that's kind of fixed. And so it's really just the ebb and flow of the bacteria that you feed at that point in time. Um, and so remember the goal for us really is to increase diversity. And so this is what people have been trying to figure out. What do I do to increase diversity? And I think the, um, the study that really uh, demonstrates that this is one of the main things that you can do is this study that was done by the American Gut. Um, and they looked at um, 10,000 you know, samples from 10,000 people from all over the world, from USA, UK, Australia. And they, you know, did a microbiome analysis. And then they also looked at the amount of plants that people, I mean, they had all kinds of questionnaires. But one of the things was, how many plants do you eat? And what they found, and again, this is diversity. So we want to be at the top, right? The, have a more diverse microbiome. And so what they see, if you eat more than 30, in this case, plants, you can increase your, um, the diversity. But what is important is, it doesn't mean I eat plants 30 times, meaning I eat the same plants over and over. You actually have to have as many unique plants as possible. And this is really what drives the differences in the microbiome, right? Is to have all these different plants that have different types of fiber, because fiber is not just one thing, it's actually a very complex you know, group of nutrients. And so by having many different plants, so really you eat the rainbow. I know one of our people on this call, I think always says eat the rainbow. So eat the rainbow and you will really uh, increase diversity, but it is, you have to do this consistently. It's not something that you can do for a week and then stop it. it you have to do this consistently. And so I'm going to finish up by just one more uh, like data slide. And this is actually one of our own studies uh, that we did. And this was done in mice uh, because it's so much easier to control their diets than it is in human beings. And what we did in this study was to, uh, to, to make mice fat. So we gave them a high fat diet. Um, and then we changed it to a different diet. We had one group on the high fat diet and we changed it to a high fiber diet to see how kind of uh, flexible this microbiome is. And so I'm just gonna explain what you're looking at here. And so again, we're looking at abundance and the different colors indicates different type of bacteria it's at genus level. And so a mouse that consumes chow is a healthy mouse. And this is what we would call a healthy microbiome in a C57 black six mouse. Um, and so at time zero, this is time zero here and time zero here, these mice just came off of their eight weeks of high fat feeding. And so first of all, you can see that there's a decrease in abundance for both of these groups, right? And so at, that, at this point, the one group continued on with this high fat, low fiber, highly processed carbohydrate diet. And you can see how we continue to lose bacteria um, or abundance of bacteria, and we really lost diversity. So that diversity, you have a few bacteria that became the predominant species. Um, and this is very different from what we had with this diet. And so this is a high, so the DF actually stands for a Daniel fast. The, the diet that we used here mimicked something that's called the Daniel fast. It really is just a Mediterranean type, high fiber, good fat diet. And I hope what you can see here is that in two months time, we could restore uh, the microbiome. And so in a highly controlled setting, uh, this is a very flexible, modifiable organ. Like it's not your heart, my heart I'm kind of stuck with, I can't do much with it. But this microbiome, I have the ability to change by the food that I eat. And so I am going to stop there and I'm going to let, you know, this uh, quote from Hippocrates where it says, let thy food be thy medicine and be thy medicine, let thy medicine be thy food. I love it, but I've decided that I'm going to change it. And so this is now my quote. Um, and I'm going to say, let thy food prevent thy sickness. Because I really feel like the microbiome is 
um, something that can be harnessed in prevention of disease. Um, like Benjamin Franklin said, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth an ounce of a pound of cure, right? And so I am going to stop there. If anybody has any questions, we'll take a few and then we'll go on to Anna. Tracy, can we, maybe if I stop share, can we see all the people and see if anybody has any, um, oops. Sure, uh, stop sharing your screen and let me, see, let me see if I can get to it. I'm hoping people are still here. <laughs> Yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to speak up, or if you prefer, you can put it in the chat. And if not, then uh, we will carry on and listen to Anna's presentation, then Dr. Corkins, and then we can have a discussion at the end. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about uh, nutrition for good gut health. And as she said, I'm Anna. So um, first off, um, the infant diet is suggested to be one of the key factors that helps shape the early life microbiota. And um, they found that breastfeeding can encourage bifidobacterium growth within the infant gut, um, which highlights a strong um, gut microbe um, association. And also breastfed infants and formula fed infants often um, differ in their microbial composition in their gut. And this includes significant differences in bifidobacterial populations, which is also linked to different health outcomes like induction of asthma, allergies, and obesity in formula fed infants. Breast milk contains prebiotic human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs that are um, preferentially fed to um, the beneficial gut bacterium, including the bifido bacterium. And although breast milk has a lower um, overall biomass, uh, the milk microbes play a really important role in helping seed that infant gut. So it's very important. Um, the bacteria in the breast milk is largely composed of Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and Enterobacter, um, which are primarily derived from the maternal areolar skin and infant oral sites and breastfeeding pairs. And I thought this was really interesting. It suggests that it's the actual nursing process, not only the breast milk that's important, but the actual nursing process, which is important to have that skin to skin contact and get more um, of those great microbes um, from the mom. So I thought that was pretty cool to learn about. Um, it's also good to know that there are alterations, of course, um, from between each mom, their breast milk is different. Um, and also the bacterial composition is different and that's influenced by the maternal BMI, um, by their weight gain, hormones, lactation stage, at what point are they feeding, you know, a one month old, are they feeding a preemie? Are they feeding a 10 month old who's transitioning to solid foods as well? So that plays a role, um, gestational age, like I mentioned, like with those premature infants and also the mode of delivery that um, was already discussed plays an important role. Um, it's been found that exclusive, exclusive and partial formula feeding has been shown to alter the gut microbiome towards adult patterns. Um, this increases the pro-inflammatory bacterial taxa, increases gut permeability, and results in lower concentrations of some of those good fecal short chain fatty acids compared to if an infant was exclusively breastfed. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And exposure to that pro-inflammatory bacteria um, and antigens during the neonatal period can um, influence oral tolerance and have long-term consequences on immune health. So um, as you may have seen promoted in different modern day formulas, they really strive to have it as similar to human milk as possible, which is great. Um, so like I mentioned, there are those great human milk oligosaccharides, which act as a, a prebiotic. Um, that's found in breast milk. So a lot of the infant formulas are now trying to mimic that with um, galacto oligosaccharides to act as that prebiotic as well. So um, as was also mentioned, um, changes in diet can modify the microbiome's composition in as little as 24 hours, but long-term dietary patterns um, do seem to determine the general types of 
microbes found in the gut. There has been there have been studies of like more than 60 mammalian species um, that's found a strong correlation between between the certain types of microbes and different dietary patterns. Carnivores tend to have different gut microbes than those of like omnivores or herbivores and diversity and resilience um, of gut microbes are um, highest in herbivores. There was a 2010 study comparing children um, in an African village with children in Florence, Italy. Um, the populations were very different in terms of genetics, environment, and dietary patterns. And so it's not surprising that they found um, really significant variations in the gut microbiomes between the two groups. The children living in Africa were mostly vegetarian and they ate a diet um, high in dense starches like millet, um, something we don't maybe eat too much of over here or in a place like Florence, Italy. And so they were found to have more bacterial diabetes in the gut. And they also discovered that the guts of the African children contained more bacteria known to enable the body to digest those plant polysaccharides for energy. And those uh, two bacterial strains were not found at all in the children from Florence, Italy. So I thought that was very interesting just how the microbiome can evolve based on those dietary patterns um, in those two different populations. So that's um, very interesting. Um, there's also a 2012 study that scientists compared the gut microbiomes of vegetarians, vegan, vegans, and omnivores living in Germany. And they found that the composition of the microbiome differed depending on the type of diet they followed but the total microbial count remained the same all around um, for all the individual participants. And the vegans and vegetarians were found to have greater microbial diversity and more microbes known for car carbohydrate fermentation and short chain fatty acid um, production, which is expected since a lot of vegetarians and vegans might um, have a diet that's higher in carbohydrates just based on their dietary pattern. So I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about the difference between probiotic and prebiotics because sometimes people get a little bit confused about um, the difference in those and some foods have probiotics added, some have prebiotics added. So it's just kind of good to um, explain the difference there. Um, so the word, the word probiotic is derived from um, Greek meaning promoting life and um, they help to do that in the digestive tract. The probiotics are like the good bacteria um, that you consume in like food or supplements. And um, they can be some of the same bacteria that reside in your gut. Um, so some people might not want to consume bacteria, but um, it, some people are consuming them without realizing it. For instance, when they're eating yogurt, um, that's one of the most common forms of foods that um, have probiotics um, in them. And there's also kefir and certain aged cheeses. Um, you can also find like probiotics in fermented vegetables, um, like pickles, kimchi, olives, sauerkraut, um, and kombucha, which is very popular these days. Um, prebiotics on the other hand are compounds in many of like the high fiber foods that we eat. Um, so we can't really break down that fiber very well, um, but the microbes in the gut um, can help do that for us um, in a process known as fermentation. So as the microbes ferment that dietary fiber, um, they produce certain compounds that serve as fuel for those um, cells that line our intestinal tract that we've been talking about. Um, so that's very important to kind of have a balance of the probiotics and the prebiotics in your diet. So you don't just wanna have one without the other because you need to have the food and um, um, what needs to eat the food as well. So um, for plant-based diets, um, I was going to mention the microbiota um, associated carbohydrates that was already mentioned. And so that's kind of the preferred term nowadays. Um, so I guess we can say MAC for short because that's easier than saying out the whole word. I really do like acronyms. So um, like was said earlier, they're, they're resistant to our digestive enzymes, but are digested by the enzymes that the gut microbes um, produce. And they include resistant starch, um, non-starch polysaccharides and oligosaccharides. And a diet rich in these um, MACs can affect the microbiota directly and indirectly. Um, the bacteria really thrive on this fiber and it helps increase in number 
and robustness on um, a MAC rich diet. But so will um, also groups of microbes that thrive on byproducts of fiber, fiber degradation. So diverse microbiotas um, are associated with better health as we has already been mentioned. I'm sure we'll be mentioned in the next talk as well. Um, while if there's low diversity and dysbiosis, it's more associated with like some chronic diseases. So it's good to have a lot of those um, MACs or MACs in our diet to help really fuel and um, promote growth of the microbiome. So um, a plant-based diet really encourages that growth um, of those good beneficial bifidobacterium, which I mentioned earlier. So we need to work on those and um, can really help with our immune system as well and help with our immune cells to function well. And I'm sorry if you hear my dog barking, my kids are coming back from T-ball practice. So you might see rambunctious kids in a, a second. Okay, so um, short chain fatty acids um, are byproducts of microbial fermentation of carbohydrates. And um, these um, short chain fatty acids help lower the pH of the intestines. They help to inhibit growth of certain pathogenic microbes. So um, they also act as signaling molecules and they affect um, gut motility. So it's unclear whether um, positive health effects are associated with these due to the acids themselves or to their interactions um, with the other metabolites um, that are produced in a diverse and healthy microbiota. So um, it's important to have um, kind of a balance there. The primary uh, short chain fatty acids are butyrate, um, acetate, and propionate. Um, butyrate is the primary um, energy source for normal healthy colon cells and they help guard against colon cancer and inflammation. Um, and they also, also help discourage development and proliferation of uh, cancer cells um, and helps to prevent against, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> arteriosclerosis. No. Sorry. Elise, go. All right. Sorry about that. My daughter wanted to make an appearance. Um, so just something to take note of, which is not too surprising, but um, so we don't take in enough fiber in our diet as a whole, as Americans um, in the Western diet. We have taken a typical like 15 grams a day um, of the average American, whereas like in traditional societies, it could be, you know, like 50 grams or even more. Um, because they were, you know, more, there's more farming and uh, foraging. So that's not too surprising that um, they probably have some healthy, um, healthier microbiomes. Um, and so it's important to also, due to those short chain fatty acids, those byproducts of the fermentation, it's good to have some of the whole grains in your diet. So that's like your brown rice and whole grain barley um, are good to have as part of a balanced diet as well. So I wanted to touch on um, the FODMAP, the low FODMAPs diet, because that's something that um, I educate on a lot. And um, it's kind of, a, can be a little bit of a fad diet, but these are poorly absorbed um, short chain carbohydrates. And that's your fermentable, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So this is usually a diet that is used for the treatment of IBS patients or irritable bowel syndrome patients. Um, because it's really hard for them to absorb these carbohydrates. They lead to bloating, to diarrhea or constipation. So this is really a form of an elimination diet. It's not supposed to be used long-term. It's supposed to be usually followed for like four weeks or so. You eliminate all these like high FODMAP foods, um, which are a bunch of the foods that are great for you. It's like a lot of different fruits and vegetables, um, gluten containing products. I mean, so it's some really good foods. So we don't want to eliminate them too long term. So it's eliminate them for about four weeks, and then you gradually reintroduce them back to identify if they're attributing to any of your IBS symptoms. So that way you don't have to eliminate all these great foods. You can maybe just eliminate a few, but still have a good balance because the issue that we see with the um, when you eliminate these long term is that it kind of lowers your short chain fatty acids, lowers your luminal pH, um, and then you'll have a less abundance of that good bacteria in your gut. So because you're missing out on a lot of those good um, MACs, so we need to really not eliminate all of those foods if we don't have to. So that's something that is important with these patients that we don't follow that too long. So we're still getting in that good prebiotic fiber. So what foods should somebody add to their diet? 
Um, I mean, it's good just to have a great balanced diet. So I have like my plate on there. So making half your plate fruits and vegetables, having a variety, like, you know, we talked about earlier, it's not like, okay, I'm just going to eat broccoli every day. It's like, no, let's, you know, have broccoli one day, have green beans the next day, carrots the other days. Eating a rainbow of colors um, is really important. Um, it's good to, you know, have some more beans and lentils in your diet. It's always good um, to have some more fiber there, um, change it up a little bit with proteins. Um, it's always good to do that, just to have a really good balanced diet and a variety of food. And these are the specific foods that just to touch on um, some of the prebiotic foods. So that's like chicory, garlic, leeks, onions, asparagus, got bananas, um, whole wheat products, sweet potatoes, and then uh, probiotic foods. So like your standard, like yogurt, kimchi, um, pepper. Some of these aren't foods that people might not eat on a regular basis, except for the yogurt. Kombucha, I'm a kombucha fan, but um, not, not everybody is, but that's another way to get in some of those good probiotics. There are some references. And if anybody had any questions or we can just move on to Dr. Corkins and ask questions later, whichever y'all prefer. Well, and it looks like we'll just move on to the next presentation. Okay, great. Dr. Corkins, I think you're muted. Now I'm unmuted. There we go. All right. So now for some, something to completely different. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist at uh, Le Bonheur, and we use probiotics therapeutically. Um, you know, and we study them and it changes the flora but it's also uh, sometimes important to, to think about how can we use these and how can we actually use them in an inter intervention sense? Um, you know, this is in a way, one of the goals of studying the probiotics and uh, some of these, it, how can we use it to help people? Um, you know, ideally we'd all eat an ideal diet. And we'd all have a perfect flora, but you know, it's not a perfect world. So, well, I show this picture because uh, there's this Ellie Metnikoff is this, this doc, and he went around the world looking at longevity, how long people lived. And he found that the longest lived people group were these Bulgarian peasants. And these folks drank huge quantities of this sour milk, fermented milk. And it contained this lactobacillus bulgarius, huh, Bulgarian peasants, bulgarius, uh, and they live longer than anybody else. And so he had this hypothesis that these lactobacilli were probably important for human health and longevity. And so he promoted in 1908 that yogurt and fermented foods were healthy and we should have more in our diets. And he was the person who coined that term from the Greek probiotic pro for biotic life, probiotics. So there he is, Eli Metnikoff died in 1916. So he's, he died over a hundred years ago and we are still just uh, now getting to, to some of the things that he recommended. But what's interesting is, you know, not, some of this is trickling down into the lay press. And uh, it's interesting is that there was a New York Times article um, just 2018. And then she's talking about uh, this, this New York Times writer is talking about how infants uh, who don't have as much bifidobacterium infantis, um, they have more illnesses and more inflammatory conditions. So all this data that you know we're looking at and trying to interpret and still looking at, it, now the New York Times is publishing in it. You know that's a high level in scientific journal. What's your impact factor uh, if you're in the New York Times? So uh, you know it's out there and people are starting to think about it and talk about it. And so we, I'm getting asked all the time, what's a good probiotic? Why you know how do we use probiotics? Um, so it, it's out there. 
Um, first off, safety. Now, um, no two bacteria are the same. You know, no two people are the same unless you have, you know, identical twins. And even them, after a while, they're not the same. Um, it's genus and specific and species specific. Um, now, bifidobacterium, predominantly, uh, that's what the species are seen in breastfed infants. And there's now infant formulas that have bifidobacterium in them. Again, trying to mimic breast milk, as uh, Anna pointed out, that's the big goal. Everybody wants their formula to be more like breast milk. That's what they advertise. So there's this formula by Fitobacterium infantis. Now it's been used for 15 years, 30 countries, more than 15 trials, more than 1,800 infants, and they more than half got by Fitobacterium and they had no, no safety issues at all. Because for years, our mindset is that foods need to be sterile, right? You know, you go into restaurants and, you know, they're trying to keep the bacteria counts down, the health department comes in. Um, and so that's one of the big safety concerns is, is this probiotic. It's a bacteria, bacteria are bad in our mindset. They're, the, they're, the, they're wearing the black hats. They're bad guys, but they aren't. We have 10 to the 12th of our bacteria in our colon. They're, they're good, they do good things, but the mindset still is bacteria are bad. What's interesting is there was a case report of some infants with short bowel syndrome who were getting a lactobacillus GG um, probiotic as a kind of a clinical trial and they had positive blood cultures. And so that was a concern. Now, the thing is though, and I was actually one of the co-authors on this. This was back in the, um, back um, years ago when I was young and skinny and my hair was brown. We gave this to short bowel patients uh, as a, a part of a clinical trial to see if it enhanced their adaptation. The cultures were positive, but the kids didn't, weren't sick. And so is it sepsis? which is a bloodstream infection, or is it bacteremia? And there are studies in you know, healthy humans that when you brush your teeth, if you actually do a blood sample, you can get bacteria in your bloodstream when you brush your teeth. So we all have some periods of bacteremia, but is it sepsis, is it an illness? Um, so basically the AAP you know, put together one of their blue ribbon expert panels and they put out this report on probiotics and prebiotics. And so I'm gonna have quotes from this because you know, um, you know, I'm one person and even though I've been involved in research and studies in probiotics and, um, and prebiotics, uh, I want you to have the, the, the gospel from the AAP uh, to show you that basically their statements on the probiotics are basically, they're safe for healthy humans and infants. Again, we don't know about sick ones. We don't know about you know immune suppressed. Um, they shouldn't be given to children who are seriously or chronically ill until the safety has been established. Again, still need to do that. And all the ingredients used in the infant formulas are, should be safe and lawful. Ingredients should be generally guarded to safer grass status. And probiotics and prebiotics are that are added to commercial formulas. Those are considered generally regarded as. they're using are ones that have been described as being of a help then oh let's talk about some of the ones that are more specific and i'm going to talk about some of the more general ones that you guys who are listening are probably more likely to see in everyday life but uh, we'll talk about some of the specific you know my specific diseases first one of them is inflammatory bowel diseases this is an autoimmune disease process where your own immune system is attacking your own gi tract um, and then there's these quality assessments meta-analysis and systemic reviews uh, using trying to use uh, probiotics to treat inflammatory bowel diseases. Of course, the studies were mixed. Um, some the uh, patients seem to get worse, some they seem to get better. Now we're to the definitive. Maybe there's a little potential in one, one of the types of inflammatory bowel disease called ulcerative colitis. But the trouble is everybody's using a different probiotic. Everybody's using a different protocol. Everybody's using, the diseases aren't exactly the same. Uh, there are some people only using Crohn's, some people only using ulcerative colitis, different types of inflammatory bowel disease. So you're trying to com you know, compare you know, apples and oranges sometimes. There is one area though, where it was shown to be helpful. Now, people who have had ulcerative colitis and had their colon removed, because it's only in the colon, they create an artificial pouch, kind of a new reservoir for the stool. So they'll have some continence and don't stool all the time but that pouch can develop inflammation called pouchitis. And there are great studies that show that pouchitis gets better when you use 
probiotics. And the best in the studies is a probiotic cocktail called BSL-3. It's called BSL-3 because there's different three different families of probiotics in it, actually eight different probiotics in it. And one of them is actually a fungus. Uh, and I know do, uh, uh, Dr. Vandermeer mentioned, I hope I probably butchered her name, Marie mentioned um, that, uh, you know, there's fungus and fungus is part of the flora too. Uh, and so again, we haven't even scratched the surface of that, um, but there's some fungi that have been shown to be probiotics uh, and pro part of our flora. But VSL-3 has been shown to be helpful in pouchitis as a treatment for pouchitis. What about necrotizing enterocolitis? Um, necrotizing enterocolitis happens in premature infants. These premature babies, uh, their gut is immature, their blood supply to their gut is immature, and they get a, an infection in their guts, and that can cause them to actually lose some of their bowel. The bowel will become necrotic and die. It's necrotizing enterocolitis. So... There was a Cochrane review done of this. And that, if you're familiar with that, that's a group that does this very stringent look at the literature and tries to come up, they'll ask one question, stringently look at the, uh, the literature and try to see what the literature, if it will answer that one question. It's a pretty arduous process. Well, they looked at the literature on preventing necrotizing enterocolitis in premature infants uh, and found basically three big, three good studies. Um, two out of the three actually showed a reduction in necrotizing enterocolitis. One was a wash. One was a 50-50. That was the, the middle study there. But I will, if I, I will point out, it's interesting that they were also kind of doing a cocktail, uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium for the two that were successful. Uh, the one that showed was a wash, 50-50, uh, uh, no significant findings. We're only doing lactobacillus GG. So again, uh, diversity is probably better, but there were some indications that maybe these would be helpful. Now, here's the problem. When they brought their probiotics to do these studies into the nurseries, all the other infants in the nursery, almost all ended up colonized as well with the probiotic. And so there was a lot of concerns about immunologically fragile, premature infants and concerns about sepsis. Again, although that one study, what the R1 report that we published earlier showed that they had bacteremia, but they weren't sick and they didn't seem to have sepsis. But these are not the same as short bowel. These are actually premature infants. So that's, that's, been, a, that's been a problem. And there's a lot of small studies, but there hasn't been any big, huge randomized trial, mainly because also the problem is you bring it in the nursery and every single infant. So how are you going to do a control group uh, if everybody, every nursery infant uh, gets that probiotic when you bring it into your nursery. Um, here is, now we're getting down to some more nitty gritty things. Probiotics for the pre prevention of pediatric antibiotic associated diarrhea. So on the flip side of this, part of the reason you get diarrhea when you get put on antibiotics is because it kills off your flora. Uh, antibi antibiotics, which if you translate it is against life, antibiotic, um, it's to kill, you know, it's to kill an infection, ear infection, skin infection, something, but it's changing your flora as well because it's killing off some of your good bacteria and you get diarrhea with it. Well, what if we gave somebody a probiotic when we're giving it an antibiotic to help support your flora? So the Cochrane Review. So again, they have a very arduous process. They said that there's moderate quality evidence that there's a protective effect of probiotics to prevent antibiotic associated diarrhea. And Lactobacillus raminose or Saccharomyces boulardii have evidence to support their use to prevent antibiotic associated diarrhea. And again, in healthy children, they saw no adverse effects. So, you know, there's moderate quality evidence that it helps and evidence that it doesn't cause any problems if you do use a probiotic. And those are the two best ones according to the evidence. This is the best one for everybody uh, to listen to. But here's the AAP statement. Probiotics can be used to reduce the incidence of antibiotic associated diarrhea. It's not a guarantee, but it'll probably make it a little better and a little shorter if it doesn't totally eliminate it. All right, here we go. 
Here's where the best data is for probiotics. Probiotics and diarrheal diseases. Probiotics uh, decrease the incidence of diarrhea when you use them in a prophylactic fashion. Great data in rotavirus that it decreases rotavirus shedding. Great data that it decreases the duration of diarrhea if you have a diarrheal illness. Decreased incidence of antibiotic associated diarrhea. Again, I already mentioned that. C. diff diarrhea recurrence was reduced in adults who got a prebiotic when they gave them the antibiotics to treat their C. diff. Um, and the problem, of course, is that, again, lots of different probiotics have been used. Uh, is it in a formula? Do you give it as a supplement, how they give it? So it's very tough to, to compare all of these studies, but there's enough evidence that when they really looked at it in, at closely, probiotics do seem to be helpful in uh, diarrheal diseases. Um, Again, and these are randomized controlled trials, our gold standard per se. Uh, so published randomized controlled trials indicated there's a modest benefit of giving probiotics and preventing acute GI tract infections in healthy infants and children. Uh, evidence to support the use of probiotics, specifically lactobacillus GG, or in the course of an acute infectious diarrhea to reduce the duration by one day. Uh, actually, the statistics were 22 hours, but basically that's one day. Uh, the meta-analysis and everything is 22 hours shorter duration of diarrhea. Now, if you think about that, that's a whole day. That's a day off work, or that's a day out of school. That's a day out of daycare. One day, is that worth it? Is that a good outcome? I think so. I, I would say yes, to be honest with you. Uh, that one day is well, a day that you save, a day that you gained. Um, and then the last one. Now, Anna mentioned uh FODMAPs for we use for irritable bowel um this is a great study the senior author on this study was a guy named Eamon Quigley uh who um was the adult GI chief when I was young and a junior faculty guy um and I I know him and I trust him and I know his work he looked at adult women diagnosed by the Rome criteria which is the most stringent criteria for diagnosing irritable bowel syndrome not based on just some willy-nilly, I have irritable bowel, I think you have irritable bowel. He did the criteria and he did a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial. And he put these adult women with irritable bowel on bifidobacterium impetus. And um, basically they had a 20% improvement in their symptoms. If you notice, the probiotic is bifidobacterium impetus. That was originally described in the stools of breastfed infants. Literally what helps irritable bowel is a probiotic that is like resetting your GI tract to when you were an infant. Is that an accident? Is that just a coincidence? I don't think so. There's gotta be a connection there. But again, we haven't sorted out the mechanisms of why that is. Um, what's in, interesting is they did a follow-up study uh, from that study population. And they actually looked at some like inflammatory markers and they actually showed a change in your circulating cytokine profiles. Those are the inflammatory hormones and that kind of thing in the, the, that comes from the GI tract. So again, so there's some crosstalk and some influence by these bacteria into uh, literally your whole immune system. It changes your immune system and how it works. Um, of course, I, I can't help but mention here, uh, kind of the last thing is one of the cool things that people have been thinking about lately is the ultimate smackdown WWE approach to changing the flora. And that's doing a fecal transplant, which seems, you know, in, in a way you think like, wow, you know, changing the whole flora by giving somebody good flora. Now, this little criteria is, you know, they try to pick people who haven't been on antibiotics, who don't have any diseases, and then try to give good flora to people who have different diseases. It was originally designed, the first place where it was used, and there was some very, very old data using it for C. diff infection you know, resistant C. diff that the antibiotics, they were antibiotic resistant. And basically what happens is you restore the flora and you put the C. diff, Clostridium difficile back in check. And it, how long does it last? It seems to, seems to work, but it's a brute force approach. Basically you transport the whole stink of flora rather than picking the, the helpful flora. You know, bully, bully approach. We'll, we'll bully the C. diff back into remission. Um, it's been tried for inflammatory bowel diseases because the thought is, you know, one of the things that may lead to that autoimmune process is some sort of abnormal reaction to uh, the normal bowel flora. But the results have been very mixed, really not in, able to interpret that yet. 
it's been suggested as something because the floor is altered in cancer, altered in obesity. Uh, can it work in these diseases? Uh, again, not enough data to tell. And then right now, all of this research is completely on hold because coronavirus loves ACE inhibitors and the GI tract is loaded with ACE inhibitors. And actually, coronavirus is excreted longer in your GI tract than it is in your airways. So all the, uh, all the fecal transplants and all that uh, intervention right now is all on hiatus, all on hold until coronavirus is under control. So nobody's doing fecal transplants right, right now. Um, so again, that's where we're at as far as uh, um, flora and treatments. So real quick summary, probiotics are safe. If you have a normal immune system, they're safe. I mean, you're just basically altering your normal flora because you already have a flora. Not all probiotics are the same. And that's one thing that is important to understand. Uh, you know, you go into the grocery store and they have an aisle of probiotics. Well, some of the studies too, it seems like one's going to be better for pouchitis. One seems to be better for these diarrheal diseases. Uh, why would we think that one probiotic is going to be good for everything? And again, the, the one cocktail seems to be better than the individual ones. Um, the literature is really good that it does shorten diarrheal diseases and prevent antibiotic associated diarrhea. And there is really good literature that it's helpful in irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, I will say those are the three diseases where I use it clinically on a regular basis um, because the data su supports it. Uh, in other places, again, the data is still out. There's not enough studies where you can be sure that it's going to be uh, uh, helpful. And that's where we're at as of April 6th, 2021. Um, I assume we'll get more data, more time as bright young people do studies and do better studies to help sort some of this uh, out. And with that, uh, we will try to uh, answer any questions you guys have. Thank you, Dr. Corkins. That was very interesting. Um, Anybody have a question? I have a question, but I'll let somebody else ask if you guys have a question. And I'll stay unmuted so I can actually answer it. <laughs> so do you, so, I mean, if I'm taking an antibiotic, would you recommend that I take a probiotic at the same time? Yes. That's do you easy. have a specific yes. one that you would recommend or any one that you would? Lactobacillus GG is the one that the ones, the, the really the best study. Um, used. And I can, interesting aside, um, I was a subject in that study. Uh, one of my other hats is I'm the medical director for a missions organization. And I travel and do missions work in um, uh, third world countries or whatever. And so uh, was on some antibiotics after a, a trip. And uh, I take, I take the, the uh, lactobacillus GG, because, uh, yeah, I want to feel better sooner. <laughs> Again, and they're safe. So what's the downside? There's no, yeah. there's no negative to it. That's the thing. And so if you should take that, is there a specific prebiotic that you should be making sure that you get in to? <sighs> the specific prebiotics, well... The prebiotics, again, are primarily fruits and vegetables and okay. the byproducts of that. And um, uh, in a way, now I'm not going to, Anna is still on. I assume Anna's still on. Um, yeah, I think she just left. She had to go do something with her kids. Okay. Um, and I don't want to belittle what she talked about, but in a way, a well-rounded diet is the answer. It's yeah. always been the answer. It's weird in that these studies with prebiotics are telling us what we've kind of known in a way all along that a very diverse, well-rounded, well-balanced diet is the best thing for your health of your gut and your body and your mind. Right. I mean, it, it, I'm, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm not trying to simplify it, oversimplify it, but in a way it is that simple. Yeah, I mean, you know, I came to the same conclusion. We do all these incredibly complicated science, and then at the end of the day, it's not rocket science. Just eat a whole food diet, you know. Um, well, what I what I think, 
what I hope is that maybe um, we are going to figure out what some of these substances are uh, specifically, and then maybe we can use them therapeutically for patients that have disease states. Um, you know, what about bifidobacterium infantis? Why is that specifically so good for irritable bowel? Mm -hmm. And how can we intervene and use that to maybe even improve the, the therapy even more? So we have a question here from Elaine. Um, given the crosstalk between genetics and the immune system and the microbiome, how will we determine what probiotics are most appropriate for an individual? Very good question. That's a great question because there is crosstalk. What's, what's funny is there's a crosstalk between the gut and the bacteria. In fact, you know, she was, she was talking about the mucus. There are actually six different mucin genes. And some of them actually have part of them that are like growth factors for the gut lining cells. Uh, they're very complex. Um, and so there's this complex interplay between the probiotic and the lining cells and the flora and the, the gut actually communicates with the flora and the flora communicates with the gut and the flora communicate with each other. Uh, and there's all these Q factors that uh, are secreted proteins. Uh, and we have secretory IgA. So we kind of sort of control it ourselves by the secretory antibodies we create. Um, and so how are we going to sort this out? Well, number one, um, part of it's going to be studies. You know, how did they figure out that the uh, antibiotic associated diarrhea is better with that? They did a study. Um, you know, how did somebody figure out pouchitis was better with, you know, the BSL-3? They did a study. We need to be studying these. We, you know, um, in a way, I, I'm, you, again, you go to GNC or even Target and you go to the digestive health aisle and there is a great aisle of what, 20, 30 probiotics. And the, and the public just, well, one's just as good as another. Well, it may not be that one's just as good as another. Of course, what they found is some of the ones and some of the, they open them up and it's like grass clippings and they're not even what they are advertised to be. The problem is, of course, they're not regulated. These are food supplements, so they're not regulated by, regulated by the FDA. Um, and so there are some the higher grade ones uh, that cost a little more money but they're, you get what you're paying for. Some of them, the real cheap ones, you'll only know if you're actually getting potency or enough probiotic to actually make a difference. Yeah. Um, Elaine, I will just also add that, you know, so genetics play a role, immune system play a role in pruning your immune system, uh, pruning the microbiome, and then, you know, the, the, the environment. So in addition to genetics and your immune system, your environment also kind of creates your unique a probiotic. So one probiotic that might work really well for one person is not necessarily going to work just as well for another person. So we are really, I mean, even though we're 15 years into this kind of field, we're really at the, the, the edge. And I think <clears throat> this is really going to drive kind of um, personalized medicine, personalized nutrition, whatever we are going to call it. Um, but it is incredibly complex um, to be able to, to understand that. So we have another question, and I think, uh, Dr. Corkin, I think this is probably one for you too. So uh, Victoria wrote, how would you space the pro and antibiotic, or are these probiotics stable enough to be given at the same time? In theory, they're probably stable enough to be given at the same time, but I separate them just because, you know, I want to make sure that I get my load, uh, you know. Um, and so, like I said, if, if you're taking the antibiotic twice a day, you know, 12 hours apart, I'd take it six hours after that you take one of the doses. Yeah, I mean, I just remember, so I'm from South Africa and, you know, we, I mean, I grew up that if you got antibiotics, we actually got the probiotics with it at the same time. Yeah. And um, that's what I did with my kids and myself. Yeah, so it's, it's not a, it's not a new concept. Um, some say to take the probiotics with food and others on an empty stomach. Uh, what's the general recommendation? What feeds the probiotic? Think about it. What feeds your probiotic? If you take it on an empty stomach, you're not taking it with anything to nourish it. So, you know, that was what, for me, that's like, that. I've been asked that question before. I'm like, feed them. 
feed the probiotics. So, so gonna... what about taking a syn syngenetic? So, you know, a symbiotic actually, a symbiotic. So for people who don't know, symbiotic is typically where they have the prebiotic and the probiotic in the same capsule. Yeah, well, I'd still take it with food. Yeah, no, I agree with you, but- um... I'd take it with food. I'd still take it with food because that's what feeds the bacteria. Yeah. Um, so Melissa Popa asks, since the immune system starts in the gut, do you think probiotics could be a potential treatment for some autoimmune diseases? Uh, possibly, absolutely, possibly. Again, we don't we don't understand it completely. Um, uh, you know, there's like I said, it's really mixed. We're trying to use probiotics for inflammatory bowel diseases, and there there's no there's mixed results on that. But again, it may not be that we have the right probiotic or that we're not giving it adequately, or we're not spacing it correctly. Um, again, we don't know. Uh, I think it's amazing that we, we uh, did some, some real early studies way, 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 way back. Well, again, just out of fellowship when I was a junior faculty, we were doing some of the early studies with uh, Bifidobacterium uh, Raminose now, now it's like the Bacillus GG, they changed the name. Uh, they, they claim they changed the name because they learn more about the genetics and understand them better, so they changed the names. I think it's just, they changed the names so the microbiologists keep their jobs. Um, we did some really early studies, uh, travelers, diarrhea. We did some of the early uh, rotavirus work um, and some of that. Um, and we've come a long way in that we understand it a lot more. We understand a lot more about the the flora itself and the biodiversity and that kind of thing. But there's still a whole lot of mechanisms we don't understand. Um, and uh, like I said, we're talking about fungi or yeast and, and there's, a, there's viruses as well. There's a virome. And uh, I haven't, I've, I've seen one study looking at virome. I've seen two looking at fungome uh, and again, the, the fungi are clearly there. Uh, there's clearly uh, fun, uh, fungal species that are flora in our GI tract. And so, uh, you know, what makes the world a wonderful place is that it's very diverse. You know, I'm seeing, I see Melissa's picture. Uh, I, I don't see Melissa, I just see her picture. She, you know, she's got brown hair, she's smiling. I think her eyes are green, I think in the picture. Look real careful. Anyway, but she doesn't look anything like me, which is good. I have gray hair and blue eyes and need reading glasses. And what makes it wonderful is the diversity and the diversity gives us strength. Some people are good at music and some people are good at science and some people can tell jokes and some people can't tell jokes. Some people can hold a tune, some people can dance. Uh, what makes the world wonderful is the diversity. Well, that's what, you know, in the gut, there's, there's probably some diversity and we need diversity. Um, and we're just talking about the gut. There's a vaginal flora, there's a nasal flora, there's a skin flora. I've seen a study on um, uh, the conjunctiva flora, the, the membrane of your eyes. Um, and after a while you start to get, we're like, okay, so the flora everywhere, um, a microbiologist uh, I know once told me, he says, if everything in the world were to disappear but the bacteria, there'd still be a dim outline of everything. It's a good way to put it. Yeah, but I think, I mean, the, the whole concept of these ecological sites, you know, and this is why things differ from one, from the, the inner ear, you know, to the eye, you see different bacteria there because of it's a different ecological site, just like it would be, you know, go to a tropical forest. You know, yep. The concept is exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. The Sahara Desert, Sahara Desert versus the uh, Amazon rainforest. So Victoria has another question. Many probiotics on the shelves may be dead on arrival. Any recommendation for patients if they would like to pur purchase a quality product, a uh, probiotic? <sighs> that, and that is a great question. And um, because there are, there are some, they're, they're dead, dead and buried. And again, you don't know um, uh, which ones. Um, there are the ones that, are, have been published as being effective in the studies uh, are the ones that you can find that are live in the, in the capsules. Unfortunately, again, I, the generics and all that, is, it's the Wild West because it's not regulated. Um, um, I'm trying not to name name brands, um, but um, 
there's a name brand. After Dr. Quigley did his study on uh, irritable bowel, for instance, Johnson and Johnson patented, quote unquote, that probiotic. Now I don't know how you can pro out, you know, patent a living bacteria that's already been around for years and years and years. But I guess the delivery system. And so Johnson and Johnson now um, sells it, manufactures it. Of course, they also make generics, and generics are made in the same factory next to the name brand Johnson and Johnson, and they advertise on TV. And that probiotic is under the brand name Align, A-L-I-G-N, okay? And that's the one that's been shown to be helpful in irritable bowel syndrome. Johnson Johnson does make the generics for like Target and Walgreens and the generics, and it says bifidobacterium emphasis, just like in Align, all right? It's more expensive, but that's one that actually, because, you know, they've done studies and that kind of thing, that one's, you know, reliable. The, the ones, that, again, if they've been used in studies and been reported, those are the ones you can trust. The other ones, you don't know. In theory, you'd have to get your own culture plate and media and grow it and see if actually what grew. And then you'd have to do some sort of a SNP analysis and see if you actually were getting the bacteria that they promised you you were getting. Yeah, Victoria, I will also just mention, you know, it's the bacteria being dead on arrival and you actually ingesting dead bacteria, it's not completely inert. No. It's not a probiotic at that point anymore, but just those components that you're ingesting is still actually affecting. Of course, it's not growing and continuing growing, but it actually is still affecting um, the microorganisms, the microbiota. So it's, 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 a, it's a very complex, uh, you know, place. Yeah, there's um, some of these uh, fecal transplants, since they're all on hiatus, there's been some uh, work where they um, take some of the fecal material that was, was up for transplant but can't be transplanted now, and then they spin it down and take the supernatant with no living bacteria in it and give it to patients, and some of them improve with just the supernatant. So it's some of the compounds produced by the bacteria. Yeah, I mean, actually, I want to, to mention this too, because I think we all jump to the idea of, pro, I mean, we have prebiotics, probiotics, right? And then there, there's also now postbiotics, which is the metabolites at the end. But yeah. I also think, you know, if you think about, you know, cultured milk or uh, kimchi, uh, you know, some of these fermented cheeses, it's not necessarily that you're getting in the bacteria itself. It is the metabolites are already in the product. So you're eating those metabolites in the product that you're eating. I just like to say, if I'm eating a Reuben with sauerkraut on it, I'm getting my, some probiotics. <laughs> you're getting the whole gamut there. Yeah. Anyway, um, so. Yeah, so anybody else have any questions or comments? If not, it's 7.30 and I'm sure everybody is ready to go do something else. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Um, Hopefully we will, you know, get a lot more information in the next few years and then hopefully we can do this again. And Dr. Corkins, I really so appreciate you being here, you know, talking more about the kind of the clinical aspects of some of these things that we're doing in the laboratory. We're learning, but, you know, we don't, it's not necessarily I can tell a person what you're supposed to do. I know how these things work, but it's, so it's really good to have the, the clinical input here too. And I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yep, my pleasure. And everybody else, thank you for sticking with us. I know it's been probably longer than we anticipated, but I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. And Tracy, thank you for doing all of this. Oh, no problem. All right. <laughs> I'm going to upload it to YouTube and send it to everyone too. Okay. Thanks, Tracy. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening. Okay.